watching my fellow Americans with your host, Spike Cohen. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm clapping for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, guys. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Clap if you believe. How would I b- know that you believe if you don't keep clapping? Welcome to my fellow Americans. I am literally Spike Cohen. Thank you so much for joining me this Wednesday, the 20th of March. March is almost over, if that's not horrifying. And uh, guys, I'm so excited to to have you guys on. This is a Muddied Waters media production. Check us out on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram. We're now on Periscope. I am now figured out Periscope. We are live on Periscope right now, I hope. And uh, we're on SoundCloud, we're on Twitter, we're on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, any podcasting app. We are on it, Muddied Wanderers Media. Check it out. Be sure to share this video right now. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I want to wa- want you to watch this live one plus hour anarchist show with me. They'll love it. They'll absolutely love it. Be sure to share the gift of Spike Cohen with a friend today. Kids love it. I would like to thank Kroger for this delicious purified drinking water that I drink on this and every episode of My Fellow Americans. Bula Banaka. The intro and outro music to this and every single episode of My Fellow Americans comes from the amazing and talented Mr. Joe Davi. That is J-O-D-A-V-I. Check him out on Facebook, SoundCloud. Check him out on Bandcamp. Buy all of his music on the Bandcamp. Uh, so thank you so much to... Um, where's that sound coming from? Anyway, thank you so much to uh, Mr. Joe Davi. Shout out to Tehran Turks, his mom and him as always. Guys, I know you've had this problem before. It's late at night. You're with your honey and you want to just Rothbard and chill. And so you turn on Netflix, nothing. You turn on Hulu, there's nothing. Maybe you go to, uh, I don't know, you go to uh, Amazon Video, nothing there. Uh, And there's a problem, you see it turns out that there really isn't a libertarian documentary out there. There's a bunch of status garbage out there, but there's nothing libertarian. And uh, I can't chill with my honey to status garbage, and I doubt that you can either. Um, well, thankfully, my guests tonight are working to give you something you can chill to. Uh, here is a teaser trailer for their upcoming film, Living in Liberty. The statist wants people to cooperate with each other, but bizarrely supposes that the only way to persuade them to do so 
is to use monopolistic force. They claim the power to tell you what kind of self-defense you can have, or whether or not you might be essential to their self-defense and self-preservation, and maybe you'll have to go and fight and die in one of their wars. We have about a 17, 18 trillion dollar economy, and we've got a 20 trillion dollar debt. The Federal Reserve claims to manage our money. Instead, it makes our money worth less and less every day. There's censorship in the news media, there's censorship on the technical platforms, the social media platforms. I saw a whole America basically giving up on freedom. Men have the free will to choose and to think. If they change their thinking, we do not have to go into dictatorship. The systems that do work are decentralized systems along the general lines of property and trade. Where every unique individual in society has a chance to influence the direction of the course of affairs of civilization, which is what capitalism really is. It's growing by leaps and bounds. It's going to continue to grow by leaps and bounds. And we will restore freedom to this country. Thank you very much. This is politics is economics. Most of all, Thoreau said we should get on with the business of living. I do not want the state to be so important in my life that I forget to live. That's awesome. That sounds a lot better than most of the other uh, things that are out there uh, documentary-wise. So let's go ahead and, uh, without further ado, let's introduce our uh, our guests here that are the co-producers of this show. There we go. That's how we would do that, too. And uh, so, let me see. That is Joshua Smith. He is our first guest. Um, we're having a, a minute here, guys. Um Okay, so first guest is uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Think Liberty. Uh, he is the at-large representative for the Libertarian National Convention, and he's currently running for chair of the Libertarian Party of California. He's also running, uh, I already said that, he's running for chair. Um, uh, please welcome Joshua Joshy Bear Smith. And last, <laughs> but, last but certainly not least, joining us uh, across the prawn in the United Kingdom, he is the head of visual media at the Liberty Institute for Freedom and Economics. Uh, he is also a columnist for Being Libertarian, and he is also the co-producer of Living in Liberty. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. James Michael Smith. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me again tonight. Yeah, and thanks Thanks for having us, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you. Um, when uh, Bear Bear here asked me if I could help promote the documentary, I didn't hesitate to book y'all. Uh, any friend of Joshua is a friend of mine, James. So thank you again. Um, guys, be sure to comment uh, with any of your questions and thoughts. And my guests and I will tell you if you are uh, right or wrong. Um, so to start the show off, before we get into the documentary, guys, I, I know more of this with Josh, but not as, as much with, with James. Uh, tell us about what got you guys into libertarianism. Uh, was it an aha moment or kind of a gradual evolution? Um, I guess we'll start with James cause he's, he's, uh, he's the first time being a guest on my fellow Americans. Yeah. It's kind of a tough question because a, a lot of libertarians answers are very self-serving because they, they go, Oh, I, I, when I heard these ideas, I saw the light, the logic just came to me and it was like, right. aha, yes, I've discovered the answer. I think it probably, um, there are, there's a um, inherent um, tendency towards liberty that people have, and um, not everybody, but uh, I think I'm in that category. That there's a certain group of people in the world who um, inherently value uh, individual autonomy, and when they hear these kind of ideas, they go, "Well, yes, I have a predilection to these ideas in the first place." Right. Um, specifically, 
Um, I was kind of into uh, conspiracies and stuff like that. And then actually that kind of stuff led, on, led me on to Ron Paul when he was talking about the Federal Reserve and the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I thought um, how incredibly charismatic it was. And he actually had a, um, a philosophy and an idea structure behind what he was saying. Right. And um, it gave a proper foundation for these intuitions as I had. And uh, from then on, I just kind of got addicted to it. And this was around 2011, I think. And after that, it was uh, Murray Rothbard and Bob Murphy and all the right, right. Australian Australians. And here I am. Very good. And Jane, uh, Joshua, I, I've already heard this, but for those of our guests who haven't uh, heard of you before, or heard your, your story as to how you became a libertarian, how did you become a libertarian? Yeah, absolutely. I served in the United States Navy. Uh, I joined that. in 2002 or something. And, uh, you know, I really got a chance to see the federal government in action. Uh, right. you know, it's, 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 um, imperialistic arm and the wasteful spending and the loss of innocent human lives. And I didn't want to be a part of it anymore uh, when I got home and, and, uh, I didn't really know where I fit politically, uh, per se until I really heard Ron Paul speaking in 2008 and, it just opened my mind to, to the fact that, you know, these wars are useless and unneeded. And, and, uh, then I found libertarianism and then much like James here, I found Rothbard for a new Liberty that just blew my mind. I, you know, I sat there and read it and think to myself for 20 minutes after each chapter and go, wow, he's right. You know? right, and, right. and, uh, I joined the, the libertarian party first time, probably some, sometime around 2010 maybe. And, didn't really find an outlet for my activism at the time here in California. Um, you know, I had reached out to the party. No one reached out back. Um, and then, uh, you know, so I continued my own brand of activism and, and working obviously with uh, Vinny and, and Caitlin and them on some some publications. And they they do great stuff and they've really helped open my eyes to a lot of, you know, philosophy stuff as well. And, um, and uh, yeah, and then I just, um, you know, I, I, joined the libertarian party again back in 2016 during the Gary Johnson campaign. And, um, not being the hugest Gary Johnson fan, I, I did see that it was probably my best option as far as, you know, presidential choices go. <laughs> and right, so right. Uh, I rallied behind that really hard. And then, and then, um, at some point in 2000, uh, late 2017, you know, there's a lot of us that were really unhappy with the national leadership structure for for the current um, Libertarian Party, and decided to throw my name out there for chairman uh, as a as a nobody. <laughs> and uh, it was really cool because I got to travel around to 26 states and and talk about liberty to thousands of people and shake hands and really get to you know see the pulse of of the freedom movement in the United States. And I get to make all kinds of great contacts. And it's it's one of the great great things about putting this documentary together is that, you know, when James gets over here from across the pond, we're gonna have no problem find, finding couches to crash on and people to interview and uh oh, vents sure, to yeah. go to and, and places to set our camera up. And so so yeah, it's really led to this. And I think it's time that the, the freedom movement gets an actual documentary that shows what it takes every day for activists to try and push a more um, libertarian, you know, public policy. And so that's, which kind of brings me to my next question. What brought this idea about? I mean, I, I kind of mentioned in my, my opening spiel that there isn't, there isn't a, another libertarian documentary out there right now, is there? I mean, there, there's some, you know, there's, there, there's the John McAfee, uh, uh, documentary. And I, I, I know they made one about Gary Johnson and his run in 2016, but I've never seen it. Um, All right. But no one's ever really just culminated the entire movement and put it on on film and showed it to people and showed how hard it is and, and how hard people work. You know, I, I deal right. with activists, you know, messaging me every day <clears throat> that have activist burnout because of how hard they work to try and push a more a more free uh, public policy. And, and I think it's time for the rest of the country to sh to see that and realize that we are a growing movement and we're not just a um, a, a shadow movement. Movement. And I, I was originally going to travel around to state conventions and, and, you know, just take video and then put something together. But James here is an amazing videographer and editor and, and went to film school and the whole nine and big time philosophy guy. And I, I just got this crazy idea one morning at work and I was like, James, let's make a movie. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. It, no, it's a, and I, I think it is a great idea. I, I, I mean, there are definitely other, I mean, there, there are, 
like you mentioned those documentaries with John McAfee and, and with uh, Gary Johnson. Um, there are also some documentaries out there with libertarian f- themes like Citizen Four, which was about Edward Snowden, um, the uh, fake case, which is about Ai Weiwei in, uh, in uh, China, Battle for Brooklyn, the lottery, uh, Green some of the, by John. Some of the zeitgeist stuff as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's yeah, stuff out yeah. there. They have themes, and they may. there are also a lot of films that will leave you thinking, man, the government really sucks, but... None of them really take that next step into taking people across the bridge into libertarian thought and activism. Even those ones about Gary Johnson and, and John McAfee, it talked more about their campaigns than it did about the uh, foundations behind what, why they were doing what they were doing. Um, so what are some of the names that you're planning on having in Liberty, living in Liberty? Oh, man. Everybody. The list is extensive. <laughs> we want to interview yeah. everybody. And from yeah. all spectrums and all uh, all different kinds of activism, activism not just the LP, but um, to, uh, economic think tanks, uh, agorists, uh, feet on the ground activists, everybody, hopefully, and the biggest names in their philosophy. Nice. Yeah, so currently, currently signed on, we have uh, names like My- Michael Bolden from the 10th Amendment Center, Gary Chartier from um, Center for a Stateless Society, uh, Tom Woods, obviously, Jeff Deist. Um, Stefan Kinsella has signed on, uh, God, who else? Uh, Dave Smith. Oh man. Uh, Adam Kokesh. I mean, uh, who else? Who else? We got so many. <laughs> you, you did the file. I just uh, reach out. Uh, Jim Cantrell. Oh, Jim uh, Cantrell. Murray yeah. Sabrin. Murray Sabrin. Yeah. Jim Cantrell, if you're familiar, uh, is the founder of SpaceX with Elon Musk and currently, oh, uh, okay. running vector space systems. Um, Murray Sabrin is big, big prom- proponent of ending the fed and, and a good friends with Ron Paul. I have currently reached out to Justin Amash and, and, uh, um, Thomas Massey and we're working on Ron Paul and Rand Paul. And so we're going to have, we're going to showcase, the political side of libertarianism, but we're also going to focus on like, like James says, uh, economic and philosophy think tanks and, and, uh, the 10th amendment center and, and stuff, stuff like that. Where you know, it's these people that may have a more niche, um, uh, movement, but they're still a part of the broader freedom movement. And we really just want to showcase all of it. So, right. So this isn't just a, and that, that was what I was kind of curious of. This isn't just like, about the Libertarian Party. I mean, obviously, that's going to get heavy mention in the in the documentary. But this is more about the movement in general, whether people are in the Libertarian Party, whether they're in another party, or whether they're even not even involved. Because I, I think you mentioned agorist, didn't you, James? Yes, and I always the foundation is the the ideology or the or the ideas, and then the party is built on that, hopefully. And so, um, uh, and political action is just one facet of the um, liberty movement as we see it yeah and and like like larry sharp has signed on and so we have some good libertarian uh party people that will will know undoubtedly be a part of this documentary and and i want i know i know we also want to stress that it's not just it's a documentary but it's not just interviews this idea through history now has grown off and inspired people very good you you guys and uh, above all these kind of documentaries that um are just talking heads and uh, very boring and dry i don't know why um Filmmakers have this idea that documentaries need to be, because they're factual, because they, they need to be really dry, like a reading an essay or something like that. We want this to be aesthetic. We want this to be beautiful. We want this to be something that's going to move people. And for that reason, we want it to look and sound good and, and tell a great story. Oh, of course, yeah. No, and that's because you. I think you would mention you know you want to have this in 4K if if uh, if at all possible. It'll definitely be shot in 4K. That's un- yeah. undoubtedly, and and that's the that's the way that all Netflix, you know, stuff is being shot now, anyways. And um, like I've I've alluded to, we have a slight opening with Netflix, so there's a good chance that we make a beautiful documentary about this philosophy and this movement, and it and it becomes a mainstream thing. And and no one's done that. No one's been able to do that. You know, even with the documentaries that have put at, been put out, the, the Zeitgeist thing. 
thing. I mean, we talk about Zeitgeist, but it's still largely a, a shadow documentary where people watch it on YouTube and talk about it in their echo chamber. And so getting people to actually watch Netflix and see a Liberty documentary that's beautiful, that's aesthetically pleasing, that's shot well, that has great thinkers and, and explains the ideology and, the, and the activism well is going to start changing hearts and minds. There's, it, there's no doubt about it. You know, and, and it's I, when I was running for chair of the Libertarian Party, I one of the things that I stressed the hardest was media. You know, we don't we just don't do well in the media. And I think that this is a really good first passionate step to getting our ideas uh, front and center in front of a bunch of normies. <laughs> so. That's why th this is a big play for, for, you know, like you said, normies to see libertarianism. Because the biggest problem with libertarianism. I don't know if this is the biggest problem. One of the biggest problems with libertarianism is that when I'll tell people I'm a libertarian and they'll go, oh, I've heard of that. What's that? And I'll right. try to break it down to them. That's the often the best case scenario. Most times they'll go, oh, you're a Republican that likes, but you like weed or, or they'll say you're those weed people or, um, or they'll say like, oh, you mean like uh, Rand Paul? And I'll be like, Rand Paul is a libertarian, but there's it goes a lot deeper than that. Or you know, they'll, or they'll say, uh, "Oh, you, uh, you know, you want us to stop? You know, uh, uh, you, you know, you want to? You're you're a globalist." Like the th things that they'll say, they don't really have a concept of what it is, but they've probably heard something negative from partisan media about it already. So they sort of dismiss it outright. And this will actually give a chance to say, "No, you know how you like hate this about government and keep voting for it." Uh, keep voting for people who promise to change something and they don't. This is why we believe that's happening and how we propose to to change that. So I think that that's a uh, a, a very powerful thing. Now, as you know, one of my favorite libertarians is Sam Coppinger. How much airtime is he going to get in this documentary? Big fat goose egg, buddy. <laughs> is going to serve a several purposes and i think one of them is to gonna is gonna gonna be to smash stereotypes right because the the majority of arguments from the republicans and democrats and even the far left is are these big straw man arguments right right and, and i think that this, i think this documentary will help smash a lot of those stereotypes very good, very good. And James, you you broke up when you were saying something earlier. I didn't hear what you said. I think it was something about Sam Coppinger. <laughs> best left um, unrepeated. Okay. Um, all right, no problem. Um, so let's see. Uh, now, I, one thing I noticed the the tr oh, so here was a, here was a question. So you guys are have a Kickstarter going right now, a campaign. Uh, what is your budget and what would you like, what are the top things that you, that you need to have money to be able to spend on, to get this, this, um, this documentary started? Uh, you know, traveling and crew are the, our two biggest expenses. Right. We want to have a good lighting guy and a guy and we're going to do a lot of traveling. And so for us, the, the budget, the goal, was a hundred hundred thousand dollars which if you've ever worked around a movie or seen somebody make a movie it's it's a very small number that's, that's not a, that you can burn through that pretty quickly right right yeah especially because we're going to be filming for a year at least you know so very cool and so i i noticed in the trailer uh it was featuring a lot of well-known i guess right libertarians like rothbard uh, Murray Rothbard, Ron Paul, uh, even some, I guess, libertarian adjacent people on the right, like Thomas Sowell, and uh, obviously you're not going to interview Ayn Rand, but th those are, it seems like kind of the people that you had on there. Is this, are you intending to have this as sort of uh, an exclusively like capitalist, right-leaning libertarian documentary, or do you also plan to include some left libertarians as well as give more of a wide angle uh, view of libertarian philosophy, or is this kind of a, we're going to promote, you know, free market capitalist libertarianism? So, 
about this idea without it. Um, th that said, um, Joshua and I both believe that capitalism is intrinsically about freedom, So, and, and that's just our interpretation of libertarianism. So we're not going to shy away from that. Um, okay. And uh, there are certain people that are not going to be like, I don't know, if we, if we did manage to interview Thomas Sowell, who isn't, let's, let's say, a pure Rothbardian, that's, that's okay with me because he's such a powerful figure. So... I'm happy to have a big tent and speak to as many people as possible that are going to give depth and weight to uh, what we're trying to say here. Well, and I've already, we've already got uh, Gary Chartier signed on, who was a, a pretty left libertarian from Center for a Stateless Society, you know, and he's, but he's really into poly, uh, polycentric law and all that stuff as well. And then, you know, I'd like to get, um, uh, Patrick Friedman in there, who's who is is capitalistish, you know, but kind of kind of goes back and forth and talks about this poly law society and and so I mean, you know, I I don't I don't think we just need to focus on capitalism, but I mean, when it comes to libertarian thought, capitalism sometimes falls at the at the forefront because it is seen as as an economic policy that is that is adjacent to freedom, and right. so I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be heavily spotlighted there's no doubt about it but we're not going to shy away from other libertarian thinkers either okay but none of the uh, unironic kim jong-un worshipers that seem to no. be occupying no, no part thanks of, <laughs> it, it, which i you know i mean hey you know who's libertarian is you know uh, juche philosophy it's like god where are we come yeah, on no. I, like no, I, 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 yeah i i'm like you know it's bad enough that that there are some who were like yeah we should vote you know republican or a Democrat, you know, for harm reduction, but then to go to the next step and be like, we need full on state communism for about 10, 15, 30 years, and then we'll have a libertarian society. Um, so we're, we're so that sounds that's legit. I, yeah, it sounds really legit. That's worked out incredibly well uh, for North Korea in particular. Um, so um, something that I had heard you say recently uh, when someone else had had asked you, uh, Joshua, they said, you know, what would you re recommend people read? if they want to find out more about libertarianism and you said they're pay stub. Um, <laughs> yep. so, so you're, you're almost as Jewish as me. And so maybe we're a little bit more sensitive to these things, but what do you think the disconnect is there where someone is like, and, and maybe you'll touch on this in, in the documentary, but what do you guys think when someone is, is will see their, you know, how much of their pay stub is, how much of their check is their paycheck is offend is affected by taxation or they'll, uh, especially in the in the UK and in, and in Canada, you buy something and it says the price is this, but then with the added sales taxes, it ends up being possibly something you couldn't even afford. You know, what do you think the disconnect is there with people that see that, but then still vote for more government? Do you think it's as simple as they're just not being exposed to the idea that they could truly have less government? Well, I think <clears throat> specifically, that a lot of people are just very used to paying taxes that they forget sometimes that they're paying over a third of of what they're making in to the state um and and that's there's this big push to to lower the voting age to 16 and boy i remember when i was 16 i got my first real paycheck and i looked at those taxes and it hurt bad so right. i'm kind of torn on that issue because man if 16 year olds could vote i bet they'd vote to lower taxes i'd almost guarantee it <laughs> you know and there are there's 16 year old kids that pay taxes and so, um, but like I said, I can remember the first time I looked at a real paycheck and I was just like, what, wait, why did you take $180 from me? Like, right. you know, like I worked for that. That's, that's like, that was like four days of work for me back then <laughs> you know, or whatever. It was a lot. And so, um, yeah, I just, um, I, I, I think that the disconnect is that people are so used to paying these taxes that they forget that how much money is being taken from them. Uh, and I think another thing is, is that they, w when it comes to taxation, there's so many different um, arms taking from you in different ways between sales right. tax and property tax and, and luxury taxes and, you know, smoking taxes and sin, or sin taxes. And, and, you know, then you have your income tax. And, and I think that, when they spread it out like that, people don't realize that sometimes you're losing 50% of what you make to the state 
every month. It's an you abs- know, and it's an absurd um, amount. Yeah, and I think it's something that we'll we'll definitely highlight in our movie, and it will de- there will be some references to taxation being theft. I'm sure of it. <laughs> I would I would hope as much. Maybe maybe like a section about that whole that whole like I guess viral campaign. James, I'm interested to hear your perspective on this because you're in the UK where there is a serious con- talk about putting GPS trackers on knives. And I'm I'm we live in a country that is has a basis in talking about freedom even though most of the time it's garbage. Like, you know, oh they're fighting for your freedom. No, they're not. Oh, we need taxes for freedom. That's the opposite of freedom. But we still, we come from, we were founded in a tax revolt and have at least in word, in words, have always kind of had a predilection towards freedom. We have a very, we were, and even before that, we were a society of people that had left Europe to basically work in this unrestricted uh, or largely unrestricted market economy, and, and which is how we've become where we are now. In most countries, it's not like that. And I think I know me personally as an American, especially an American living in a smaller government state in an area that wants less government, I lose track of the fact that even in like, you know, not, not even looking at a communist China or a North Korea or whatever, even in a place like the UK, that's not even in the conversation. It, talk, talk to me about, about what, what, what that's like there. It's a living nightmare. I can. I don't know what's happened. It seems to have happened all of a sudden. Where I seem. I don't know whether I'm just noticing it more these days. But um, we're having a. What are we having now? There's been a ban on the showing of uh, junk food, uh, like billboards on the underground in London. Okay. And uh, they're also trying to uh, ban junk food adverts on television. And on the first of April, you're going to have to hand your credit card details into uh to Pornhub if you want if you want to watch uh watch porn videos um and at no point during and i know these sound like minor things but they kind of accumulate and you start to wonder what exactly is going on here what what's happened um and when this discussion comes in the public eye there is nobody nobody there's no public figure who will sit there on one of these chat shows and say hang on why do we just leave people alone? That it's just that instinct just seems to be absent from the British people, and I don't know why. So no um, one's even discussing that. Even in the on the fringe, there's not really. There's a few think tanks who are really good. The IEA is really good on this stuff, and they're okay. pretty much their only voice. They're kind of a classical, that's classical liberal, neoliberal outfit. So they're not, you know, completely libertarian, but they're they're good on this topic. Um, but they don't really get a platform and everyone just says, oh, who funds you? Who funds you? You must be funded by big food or something. <laughs> big oil, big, <laughs> big tobacco. Right. Um, but I really admire uh, the United States in this sense that they really do have a foundation in, in, in freedom. And you guys are like 100 years ahead. If we're going in the direction of freedom, you guys are 100 years ahead. Because so you have so this, like back, uh, back when we kicked you guys out of here is what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. Well, you know, I, we're, I was actually discussing this with um, a mutual friend of ours, Jesse Fullington, about what would have happened if the um, Americans had not won the Revolutionary War. Um, I, was, I was thinking, well, there probably wouldn't have been the Civil War. Probably wouldn't have been Woodrow Wilson. Therefore, no First World War. Therefore, no Second World War. Therefore, no Cold War. And therefore, no Middle Eastern war. And it would have been better. So, I, ironically, just a thought experiment. But no, joking aside. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of assumptions. There's buddy. a lot of a things lot. happening there, pal. <laughs> By the way, I just want to note, because I've had people say, well, but if, if the American Revolution hadn't happened, we would talk like them. And I said, no, 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 no. They actually talked like us back then. Yes. Then you guys started adopting, I guess, in the early 19th century, uh, pronouncing your R's and W's and certain words differently so that you now talk the way you do. But we actually all talked like I do, specifically, yeah. not James, Joshua, me. Um, and so that, if we hadn't won, we'd all talk like me. So I think I just yeah. helped you. Yeah. In your um, argument. Well, Shakespeare apparently was... Uh, spoken in an accent not too dissimilar to um, uh, Georgia. 
<laughs> a Georgian accent, which I, I find mind-blowing. But when it's performed in the Globe Theatre, they have my posh affectation, right, the like, RP. Right. They don't have know, the, the, the real housewives of Atlanta. Nobody spoke like that. Only the Queen speaks like that. Right, right, right. The, queen, the Queen's English. The Queen's English. Yeah. Even her, actually, even her accent has changed over the years. If you listen to audio recordings of her in the when she was first, um, first she first uh, started her reign, uh, it was like "hia" and "ter" and "tourist." I'm a tourist, but nobody says that anymore. So she, now she says "tourist." So even she's moved with the times. Nothing so sacred. So yeah, <laughs> nothing sacred. Not even how the queen talks is sacred. No. So yeah, so that that's an interesting thing to me. We some of our comments here. We got a lot of people saying that they also hate Skype, and I'm with you on that, Um, uh, because I told them we were having some Skype issues. Um, Someone asked if you guys are brothers. No, no relation. Um, That's interesting that they would that they would ask. Um, uh, Someone said, uh, "I think 16 year olds will would vote for more and greater entitlements and free stuff. It's a genius move for short sighted Democrats and for long game socialists." Uh, who will be using this step to de-incentivize competition and striving for achievements to put incentives and higher goals for these as young adults. 16-year-old would vote on keeping allowances from parents and government. You know, it's it's a tough one for me. See, and I'm where Joshua is that when I was yeah. 16, I, I was like... I don't, agree. I don't agree with that. I'm 100%. like, leave my paycheck sure. alone. But then, I mean, I'm also an anarchist. So, I mean, <laughs> maybe we're, we may not be representative of other 16-year-olds, but... Um, I, I, I don't know, maybe at that age, they're just thinking how many 16 year olds work at this point? Like, like when I probably quite a bit, you know? Yeah. I don't, I think so. In America. Yeah. In America. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's a tough, I don't know. I don't know the exact stats, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, I meet you know, every time I meet, or talk to somebody online who's, you know, 16 or 17 or in like in one of these, you know, groups or something. They're always, they always seem to be super liberty, liberty oriented. I don't, I don't think it's a tor- terrible idea. You know what I mean? But are those libertarian groups that you're meeting them in or just general, whatever? Sure. I, I mean, I've seen, I've seen plenty come to like conventions and all kinds of stuff. You know, I, we had them come to our County meetings and I, I just, I think that there's a growing Liberty movement uh, with, with, the younger generation below us. And so I don't know that it would be a bad thing, but no one can really say like that. They're all going to vote for entitlements because 16 year olds don't really get entitlements per se. Anyways. Directly. You no. Know I mean? Yeah. That's a good point. Like their parents are. So they're not even aware of that. Mm-hmm. They don't even know what an entitlement, half of them don't know what an entitlement is, but they see their, their paycheck from hostessing at, you know, the local red lobster and right. it's $150 less than what they had. And they're like, well, wait a minute, you know? So, I don't know. It could go That's either way, point. but you know, like I said, I'm torn on the issue. I don't, I don't think it's a great idea. I don't think it's a horrible idea. I just, I don't really know what would happen, but I know that when I was 16 and I got my first paycheck, I was pretty upset with the government. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I wonder how good of a cross section we are. Cause like literally I was almost an anarchist at 16. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sure, not sure, yeah. but, but maybe that's how most people are that age. I, I honestly don't know. I mean, my first impression was like, I think they should raise the voting age to whatever is a year older than the oldest person on earth. And we can just be done with this, like voting ourselves. Yeah, that'd be great. Into, like, I'd like know. to just abolish voting altogether. I mean, if, if that was possible, you know, every time it comes up, I'm like voting should be punishable by death. Like, why are we talking about, more people? <laughs> why are we talking about more voting? This is a terrible idea. So James, what, what is your thought on that? Like this, this voting thing, what do you think would happen in the UK if the average 16 to 18 year olds were, were brought into the voting base? Well, it would almost ensure that Jeremy Corbyn would become prime minister. That's the socialist, from, the Labour Party yeah, had, right? Yeah, and he's, he's, he's explicitly a socialist. He's not like a, a social democrat. Like, he's explicitly sees the means socialist. So he's not messing about. He, he turned the UK into Venezuela if he could. So that's, that's, that's one thing. On, on the other hand, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I don't vote myself. I'm not a big voting fan. And right. it wouldn't bother me that much. Um, maybe that's exactly what this country needs to kind of speed up the decline. <laughs> I don't know. The ex- acceleration. I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent. Yeah. We're all joining the collapsitarian caucus, really. At this, I point. tell you what, we, I, got, they, we, they we, we got people, but we got people pushing for a Yang presidency, knowing that it's going to collapse the economy. I joined so. the Yang gang for the memes, 
And I'm sticking around for the accelerationism because, first of all, I like the hat, and a thousand bucks is a thousand bucks, and um, and uh, and uh, if it also like everything falls apart as a result, then I at least I got to keep the hat. So I'm 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 kind of there. Well, and you got an extra thousand bucks a month. For got a thousand bucks a month. <laughs> we talked about this on not this last episode, but the episode before the muddied waters of freedom. You know, you get the thousand bucks. And you buy guns with it, and then when they ban yeah, guns, exactly. now it's showtime, and you know that's that's fun, huh? But um, so <laughs> I'm sure you'll touch on that in the documentary. Um, yeah, so gotta get that bag, bro. You gotta get the, <laughs> get the if he would probably do your 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 show, and uh, you could just put sure like money bags around him during the during the interview. So who else is in besides you guys? Who else is involved in? in uh in the you know the, i guess the behind the scenes of of living in liberty or is this a two-man operation right now yeah so we have we've ad- added quite a p- few people to the social media team uh it's been kind of quiet i've been sick so um th- it will start ramping up soon and like james and i have talked about if if we don't hit our kickstarter goal we're going to continue it's not just going to end there. We would like to hit our Kickstarter goal, but it's a it's a slow start. You know, people people want liberty to be mainstream, but they don't want to donate. You know, it's kind of it's it's a, it's, it's a yeah. double edged sword here uh, with the liberty movement. You know, and it's we've seen it with candidates and all kinds of activist issues, and people are like, "Hey, I'm going to take the the reins here and go and do something awesome," and everyone's like, "Yeah, don't call me for money," right? <laughs> you know, and it's like, all right. So we'll we'll figure out a way, but we would we would really we've like got plenty to, of time left. When it comes yeah. to it, there's going to be more people involved in the in the in the crew, and would like to hire some really good technical hands so um, I can focus more on the um, I don't know the, the the overall. Like it's very difficult when you're on the road to make sure you get all that technical stuff right because as soon as the, if the sound is not quite right, this all the the cameras on the piss or something like that. Right. It does take away from the legitimacy of what you're trying to say. And people are usually not very forgiving. Audiences are really, really harsh. And Netflix are very high standards about what, what they And have. everyone's a critic. Everyone's a critic. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's got to be aesthetically be- beautiful. It's got to have a compelling narrative. It has to have a good uh, 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 was it storyline. You have to, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of aspects to, to what you have to do. I will say, uh, I think Amazon standards are a little bit lower. Because my wife made me watch a multi-part documentary about these foolish, foolish men who got on a pontoon boat and took it to the, um, or wasn't a pontoon boat, but it wasn't much bigger than, no, I think it was a pontoon boat. And they took it all the way to the Arctic and it was, uh, it was, uh, produced by them and edited by them and it showed, um, that it was edited by them (laughs) and that they had no editing experience. And it was a terrible thing that was seven hours long. And I, if I wasn't married to an amazing woman, I wouldn't have watched 10 seconds of it. Um, so you definitely will be able to get on Amazon. Th- that was decide- That was noticeably not on Netflix. So I do think Netflix probably has higher standards than Amazon apparently does. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I mean, and you have, I mean, I don't know if you guys have like a, a hard deadline or whatever, but it's not as if, if it's something doesn't happen by a certain time, people are going to step in and go, okay, no more documentary making allowed right like i mean it's this is it's going to happen when it's ready to happen well there's a kickstart there's a kickstarter deadline they only oh, let you okay. uh fundraise for 60 days um and i think we're at like 40 days left or something or a little less than 40 days so um and i think we've raised 500 bucks or something <laughs> uh we got a couple of big donors that are interested in donating uh and and i keep waiting for him to do it and become these executive producers on uh, you know for the the show and there's a lot of really good rewards on there as well you know you, you can uh if you're if you have a you know a story that you want to tell in the movie there's a t- there's a reward tier for you to be featured in the film you know there's a reward tier for you to become an executive producer and have your name on the film um there's you know there's small thank you uh, rewards tiers where we put your name in the end credits and there's a signed Blu-ray and the uh, signed t-shirt and a poster. And so, I mean, there's lots of cool stuff for people, you know, it's, it's, you know, it may not reflect the price they pay for it, but it's, it's cool stuff and a reminder of a documentary that may help our, our philosophy and our ideology become mainstream. 
Very cool. And we have the uh, uh, links to the Kickstarter in the show notes. Wherever you are watching or listening to this, you should see their Kickstarter in the show notes. And it has all the different tiers for, you know, if you donate and everything, What uh, when you go to that Kickstarter, uh, what you can get if uh, if you become a part of that. I wanted to get your, your thoughts on uh, on some of the things that are going on right now, um, because I think for people watching this to kind of get an idea of the people that are putting this together, what they, they think about things that are going on. Um, obviously, the biggest thing in the news right now is this this shooting that happened in New Zealand. Um, obviously, I don't I don't think I have to ask you guys if you agree with. I think we all dis- obviously disagree with killing lots of people because we don't like their religion or their skin color or whatever. I, I will I will assume that on our, on everyone's behalf um, uh, for two reasons: one, because I know that we all believe that way, and two, because if one of you doesn't, then I I don't want you to say it on the show. Um, but also, uh, uh, <laughs> it's like now now watch our documentary. Um, but, um, the aftermath of it and the reaction, not just in New Zealand, but I mean, it's happening in here in the U S I'm sure in the UK, there's something, well, you guys don't have guns. So, um, but, uh, uh, sort of, but, but a reaction, not just to, to in gun control, but in, um, in, you know, banning the uh, viewership of this video or, or sharing it or whatever. And sort of this reaction that like a terrible thing has happened. So the government must, restrict our freedoms and and things like that where do you think that comes from and and how how will you guys address that in the in the documentary because because that's going to be a big part of someone watching this is they're immediately going to fall back to their to their their fear points of well what if this happened or what if that happened yeah i think i think highlighting the two million crimes that are stopped by legal gun owners every year in the united states is a really great highlight for that point you know, New Zealand has less than a million guns in the whole country. Right. And, uh, and I watched that video. Unfortunately, I watched the entire thing, uh, from start to finish. Had someone in one of those moss had a gun, that man wouldn't have made it more than a minute. Uh, he wasn't checking corners. He wasn't strategically positioned. There was just, it was, it was one failure after another gun jams. I mean, there, the, to me, this is a very good reason why people should own guns, why people should carry guns. Um, if that had happened in a church in Texas, it would have it wouldn't have been the same thing. He probably you wouldn't know? have made it in the door because there were people it that saw him when he was when he was loading up and walking in. Yeah, he wouldn't have made it in the door, and yeah. that's just the, that's the that's the ugly truth. There's evil out there, and people should be allowed to protect themselves against evil. It's just how it is, and and uh, you know I'll continue to bang that drum and fight for those rights for people as much as possible. I think that should be a worldwide thing. I don't think they should start taking more guns from New Zealand after there was just a mass murder in New Zealand. I think it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. And um, everyone's going to have a different reaction to it. But the the problem for me is that this man put out an 80 page manifesto and he is getting the exact reaction that he wanted. It's exactly what he wanted. It's, it says it right there in his manifesto. They are literally kowtow to this man they're doing exactly what, what he actually wanted you know we, we we talk about well if you do that the terrorists have already won he's winning like he's he has gotten every single thing he wanted attention he wanted to get arrested he wanted white nationalists to defend him he wanted governments around the world to restrict the rights of people to trigger what he believes will be and, and this is where i think he he got it wrong i think he he's thinking this will trigger some kind of big worldwide civil war between whites and others and i i don't i don't think that's going to happen but um I but i but what it might trigger is a lot of people saying i don't know what gun you're talking about i lost that you know there's gonna be a lot of boating accidents over the next few weeks uh there's been a, a lot of boating accidents over the last tragic years man tragic i i can't forget when i was out on my dinghy uh hunting uh hunting that's how much of a fisherman i am uh fishing for cod and and <laughs> lost all of my guns and uh a couple of other things that uh, uh, aren't allowed anymore. It's very sad. James, what's the conversation like in the UK right now after that shooting? Like, what are people saying that the government should do, quote unquote? Um, we're very preoccupied with Brexit at the moment, so we haven't been oh, yeah, that's right. too interventionist when it comes to, you know, we're, we've always been a pro-gun control country and we take it as a point of, at least like a, a special badge that we have that to make us feel superior to Americans because we we're not like those barbaric people who go around shooting in the United States. Ha ha ha! These right. gun nuts. Right, oh, right, right. Geez. Listen, okay. 
I love to take the piss out of Americans. It's kind of just kind of thing that British people have to do. It's a very on British this, thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. On this on this particular thing, they're actually absolutely right. Like, um, uh, guns stop crime. Unbelievably, like this, uh, this would not occur to me as a teenager, but it was actually thanks to being uh, getting deep into the American libertarian weeds that I uh, discovered the stats and also the relationship to weapons um, was completely different uh, because you are a revolutionary country and the relation your relationship to weapons is we need these to defend ourselves against tyranny against the government um, right 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 we don't have that because that hasn't happened in a thousand years right uh so we, we're just not programmed to understand that unfortunately um what has happened though is that um specifically to do with the moss shooting um a, a few everyone seems to be trying to exploit it and pin it on their political enemies so at the moment there's left-wing journalists retweeting headlines from right-wing tabloids um that were reporting on uh rotherham which is a city in northern england and uh, there was a big conspiracy of uh, like a, a pedophile ring involved with uh with muslims the grooming gangs right yeah that's right right and uh these tabloids were um had these very okay yes they're very inflammatory headlines and and not good but owen jones this uh, guardian journalist is saying uh shooting is your fault because of these headlines it's like it's very cheap and it's only going to make people mad like this if you're like if you were if your first priority is to reduce conflicts don't do that of course of course <laughs> And that's completely not uh, with no judgment on the headline or Owen Jones. Just don't do that. The last thing we need right this second is hysteria. But they kind of want hysteria, right? Like, I mean, that, that's hysteria drives bad ideas. So, I mean, if, if, if people are thinking rationally, you can end up having a rational debate about weapons, about whatever tax policy, about Brexit, about anything else. But if people are all in conflict and, a state of crisis. Well, we don't have time for that right now. We have to, whatever terrible idea someone's trying to push. I'm, I'm curious about Brexit. I, yeah. I know that they just asked for uh, uh, what Theresa May. She just asked for a, a de- uh, 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 to push the deadline back to June 30th. And I guess every Brexit plan they've put forward <clears throat> has um, not has 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 failed in the in the uh, Parliament. What is uh, uh, like what is the story with that like so i know it passed by a a pretty razor thin margin that was it was actually expected not to pass so it was kind of unexpected that it did pass um is is the is the sentiment and i i know i'm i'm you know hey you're british tell me everything that's happening in the uk (laughs) but do you think the sentiment has changed overall would you say that it's more anti-brexit than it was say during the time that they had the vote um i think at the end of the day, people are just kind of sick of the whole thing. They're right. sick of the whole debate. They're sick of the uh, vitriol on both sides. Right. And the what they what is seen as prevaricating on behalf of the government that they just want it over and done with. That nobody can agree a deal. The two parties are split straight down the middle because it's, it's not left or right anymore. It's leave and remain. Right. And there's actually leavers and remainers in both parties. You have Theresa May, who's actually a Remainer trying to negotiate a deal with the European Union to withdraw. Even and though she's on the center the, right. Yeah, more or less. But she's she's the kind of person, she's a really milk toast. She's right. really annoying, actually. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who is actually a lifelong uh, Brexiteer, but has had to kind of soften his views because most of his party are Remainers. And he's trying to lead a party and trying to um, uh, act as if he he's actually for Remain when he's not. So there's an absolute impasse in Parliament at the moment. Uh, and the withdrawal deal that Theresa May negotiated with the EU is is disastrous because it's basically remaining in the EU but without a seat at the uh, European Parliament. So there's not even a chance to debate their bullshit commission. 
uh, it was bullshit anyway, but at least the, we were there to be able to debate the bills that went through and were imposed on us. With the new withdrawal bill, it would keep us essentially within the customs union and um, the scope of the European Court of Justice. So our highest courts would be ruled by Europe, even though we're technically outside the European Union. So, so it's what? actually better to stay in. So that's why this vote's been knocked down, is because the Brexiteers don't like it. And the Remainers don't like it because they want to actually just stay. So the the newest Brexit plan would be basically you're still for all intents and purposes in within the jurisdiction of the EU, but there wouldn't be any more MEPs coming from from the UK. In essence, there's uh, the bill is massive. <laughs> the, the, the withdrawal bill is huge, so there's lots of stuff in it. Right, and but this is all under the sort of transitional arrangement um, which was originally designed because Northern Ireland is still part of the United Kingdom um, but they have a soft border so basically goods and people can go in between Northern Ireland and Republic Ireland all the time Right. if Ireland is still part of the EU and Britain is out of it then that causes a problem at customs so that excuse has been used to keep us more or less within these guidelines for an unspecified amount of time and we cannot unilaterally pull out of that, even if we wanted to. There's no, there's no set deadline, and it's basically up to the EU's whim as to when we can actually leave properly. It's terrible. <laughs> well, well, Godspeed with that. Goodness, that is a terrific. That's. I mean, I thought it was just people dragging their feet because they didn't want to do it. I didn't realize it was like now it's going to be even worse. That's. Um, here's here's the saving grace okay so (laughs) parliament the other day voted to have an intention to make a deal before the the brexit deadline which is the 29th of march so in eight days time or something like that okay um but legally speaking that's what's going to happen anyway if there is no deal so they have a week (laughs) okay so the next plan is to try and extend the deadline, but that's not a given either because each of the EU member states have to agree to extending, extending Article 50, which is the article that helps us withdraw from the EU. And, God bless him, Emmanuel Macron is, might, is probably going to say no, and they need unanimous agreement. So... After all that, the French are going to save us, and I think we're going to have no deal. We're going to leave without a deal, which would be brilliant. We just clean break, uh, and we'll be free. It would be brilliant. <laughs> yeah, what? What? because people would say, like, leave without a deal as if, though it's the worst thing ever. But that sounds like it's actually probably the best thing, right? It's a it's complete fear-mongering. Okay, so if we do withdraw from the EU without without a deal... There's, we go back to World Trade Organization rules, which does have some tariffs, and we will, will have to negotiate a new free, free trade deal with the EU. But that would meet. But hey, in a couple of years, that's all sorted. We've done. We, then we do a trade deal with the US, with India, with China. And yeah, uh, now you can do all your own free trade deal. You can do all your own trade deals instead of being tied to EU deals, right? Absolutely. So that's way better. It isn't. It doesn't stop us from having a relationship with the EU later on. It's just that in the meantime, there may be some teething problems. And it'll be fine. I, kept, I keep telling people, listen, it'll be fine. Just calm down. <laughs> yeah, no one's going to no longer want to trade with the, the UK and its environs. Like, I mean, it's, it's, a G, it's a G8 country, right? Absolutely. And, this, and, and also as part of the Commonwealth, we also have an amazing relationship with Canada and Australia and New Zealand. Um, and they're acting like, oh, we're not going to have any bananas or <laughs> the, we're going to run out of fuel for our ships and they're just going to sink. Oh, stupid things, daily things that come through the news to try and, right. ooh, no deal. As if some, like, there's going to be a giant metal wall that springs up on the 29th of March. Right, and right. And we'll, we'll trade with nobody. That's and we won't be able to leave. Pre- preposterous. Yeah, no, that's ridiculous. So that's... There's you will definitely hopefully we'll at least touch on that. I mean, I guess it's it's hard to do it because it's so it's something that doesn't directly affect us and that um, 
that you know is so complex that when you start talking about it a lot of people are going to kind of glaze over so let's start talking about guns again because everyone likes talking <laughs> about that one one uh uh josh had mentioned the statistics about crime and guns um what was interesting when uh we have harambe in every poll uh tuned in to watching us that's Mike, apparently michael, a, that's michael lemoncello i love that okay guy. and he said bananas yeah so dicks out for that um, but, um, but we, when it, when it comes to guns, so I was raised by an extremely, uh, radical, I guess, reactionary rabbi who told me the government is eventually going to come for the Jews. And so, cause it's happened everywhere else. And so we need our guns for when the Jews come, which made me cry when I saw police officers as a kid. But, but so interesting childhood, but, uh, so when people would talk to me about like crime, and I'd say, I don't give a, I don't care about crime. They're coming for the Jews. We have to fight back against them. So I had a very, you know, unlike many other people, I had a very unique reason for, you know, even when I maybe didn't consider myself a libertarian saying like, we need to have guns. Like we, we, we absolutely, well, maybe not you, I need to have a gun. Um, so, and like you said, James, in, in the UK, I mean, the last time you had a revolution was... You never had a revolution. You had a, 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 some some wars like between different uh, aristocracy and things like that. But you've never had like a I guess since the Magna Carta, you've never really had like a you know uh, a where the the I guess common folk, for lack of a better word, overthrew the government. And even then, they, they didn't actually overthrow the government. There were so I mean, there's never really been a there's never been like an actual revolution in the in since since the 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 the, the British crown has been there, right? Um, we had a civil war, uh, which um, introduced it. That was the beginning of what you might call democracy in this country. But it was not. It, uh, it's, uh, is it a revolution? I'm not really sure. I'm actually better on American history than I am on British history. So maybe oh. I'm perhaps the wrong person to ask. But you're, you're absolutely right. We don't have that same revolutionary spirit that's been it's been beaten out of us, bred out of us, I suppose. Right, uh, right, right. We're the, we're the establishment. So if you can ask a British person, that, not, with the exception of me, obviously, about anything Every at all, they're going to side with the establishment, unfortunately. Right. right. And now, Joshua, you live in the UK of the US, California, um, or I guess more of the, maybe not at the least UK. At least it has good weather. So it's the France of the of the U.S. <laughs> well, here's the, the thing Jesus. for me, and, and this is what I this is what I hate about the push for gun legislation is that the majority of those who push for stricter gun laws are coming from a place a place of privilege. You know, I grew up I grew up in the hood. I grew up in the hood. You know what I mean? People got shot where I lived. You need a gun in your house. Right. <laughs> you know, right. and so and so this this whole this whole we shouldn't have guns here it's it's always upper middle to upper class white people from the suburbs who have never had to deal with any kind of crime in their neighborhoods and and so it's it is it comes from a place of, of privilege and and uh, I wasn't privileged growing up in that aspect and I see the need for self defense uh, throughout the country especially where I'm from uh, you know outside of Oakland and uh, it it just it just boggles me to to know that these people uh, sleep soundly every night in their neighborhoods where they have never had a crime and they think that guns should be taken from people who are from bad neighborhoods. It doesn't make any sense. And right. then you see what happens when they do it. You know, you see Chicago and places in New York where the crime has quadrupled since the you know some of these strict gun laws. And it's like, how can you see that? And, and continue to push for gun legislation. It just blows my mind. I don't get well, it. All of our mass shootings since the Kent State shooting, which is what actually what began the whole... So it was the Kent State shooting. I forget which happened first. The Kent State shooting and the assassination assassination of JFK. I, I forget what... They both happened relatively in the same time. But, but those two things happening are what started this whole uh, banning guns in public places. Um, oh, yeah. Since then... Every single mass shooting has happened in a place where either guns weren't allowed or where they were heavily restricted. They've happened in malls, oh, yeah. they've happened in theaters, they've happened mostly in schools, and they've happened on military bases, which ironically people go, oh, well, what about military bases? 
Guns aren't allowed on military bases. Mm -hmm. They have private security teams that provide the security there who usually aren't that good. And then a bunch of people who are actually trained to use weapons who uh, are because of uh, uh, interpretation from the uh, from the executive branch about uh, posse comitatus. They don't carry weapons domestically. And so you've right. got a bunch of unarmed people who are actually uniquely trained to deal with that kind of a situation and they can't. Um, and so, it's, it, you know, in my mind, that alone should be it. And, and it's like, like you just said, that's from a, a place of privilege to say, well, the police can handle it. Maybe for you, but in a lot of places, the police aren't going to come in this, in this shooting that just happened in New Zealand. It took the police 36 minutes to show up. 39 minutes, actually. I understand. It took the police a lot longer than it would have taken a guy or woman, a, a human being, I'm not assuming genders, uh, to pull out a weapon and 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 shoot the guy or scare him off because I think at the second mosque it was a uh, it was a uh, uh, one of the parishioners, one of the Muslims there who used a gun to scare the guy off, right? Pulled the, pulled the gun, yeah, saved a lot of lives. And then and they're not the, talking about it. They're not talking about well, it. Well, of course, of course they're not going to talk about that because that destroys their entire narrative. <laughs> Also, the at the first because I watched because I do this show and the other show, I thought I need to watch this so I can talk about it intelligently, and I I hated every second of it. But the it, when he and like you said, there was no situational awareness. Some one person with a gun could have stopped that easily. Um, and he was Very acting quickly. like someone who knew he was the only person that would have a gun there, and uh, to the point where there was actually someone that was able to rush and tackle him, but he was able to shoot the guy. Uh, as he was doing it. Imagine if that guy had had a gun, this would have been over. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's Absolutely. just, a, it's just a terrible thing when, so James, I, I assume you talk with, with people in the UK about, uh, you know, like, you know, guns and things like that for the average UK person, the idea of deregulating guns and allowing everyone to have guns, what does that look like to them? Uh, chaos. Um, just mass, just the end of the country. Right. The, Mass murder 24-7. Um, whenever I try and broach the subject with um, anybody <laughs> anybody here, it's like, so you want, so, 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 let me get this straight, you want to give six-year-olds um, M4s? Uh, wait, 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 what? Who? Uh, no, what? <laughs> so, no, hang on. I kind um, of do, but I, I, I mean, so, and this is maybe a difference between you and me. When someone, so I'll say, you know, I think drugs need to be, decriminalized and they'll say like oh you think that you know guns that you know that five-year-olds should have drugs and i'll say i didn't say that but anyway um so guys i know that i know that we're we need to we need to wrap up so i really appreciate uh i really appreciate your time um i have your your information in the show notes but i want to give you guys time uh each of you and i'll start with josh uh, to give your final thoughts, anything that you think we didn't cover, final plug for the show, anything you want to say, I'll start with Josh. The uh, the show, the uh, floor is yours. No, I think we covered some some good space here. We we talked about the documentary. I just want people to know that it's going to be a beautiful Liberty documentary uh, that's going to showcase all of your hard work um, and and all the hard work of activists around the country and and uh, hopefully give us some mainstream media that that actually makes a difference for us and. Um, yeah, you check us out at in living uh, living in liberty at Kickstarter or uh, uh, what's the other one at at living in liberty movie. Uh, the website is living in liberty movie dot com. So com. yeah, checks out. Cool and James, new teaser you... coming out soon, right, James? Absolutely. And James, anything you want you want to add to that? Please donate anything you can. If it doesn't, if we don't reach the target, then you no money gets taken from your account. Um, but Please do. It won't you. It, you won't be disappointed. It will be uh, absolutely fantastic and inspiring, and um, it'll help bring this philosophy to a whole new range of people that have never even heard of it or, or really understood it. Um, all the links Joshua said, jump on. Um, uh, maybe also check out my interviews for the Liberty Institute for Freedom Making Freedom and Economics on Facebook. I interviewed Jeffrey Tucker and Christian Nemitz and got one coming out with The Philosopher. Nice. I love The Philosopher. And you, and also your articles on being libertarian, right? Yes. I have a column called Opting Out. Nice. Very good stuff. Thank you guys again for joining. And guys, thank you again for watching us uh, on tonight's episode of uh, My Fellow Americans. Uh, join us uh, tomorrow. 
on um, Matt Wright's show, The Writer's Block, as uh, he talks with his guest, Sherry Voluntary. Um, and then join us again on Friday night uh, for the Wholesome Sabbath episode of Mr. America, The Bearded Truth. Have a great weekend, and then uh, join us again from on Monday uh, for the uh, Mr. America, The Bearded Truth for the Monday episode. Uh, then on Tuesday will be the Muddied Waters of Freedom, uh, where Matt Wright and I parse through the uh, week's uh, news with our unique uh, take on it. And then uh, I will actually not be having an episode next week because it is the week of my wedding anniversary and I will not be anywhere near a computer or a webcam, hopefully. Um, so guys, thank you again for joining us and we will see you all again soon and God bless you. I recognize that body outside my